be here. Really uh, happy to see so many of you here. And really an extra pleasure to have Mr. Martin Purcells here. Sorry, I'm going to hobble between the <laughs> architectural element here. <coughs> Again, Mr. Martin Purcells. Um, over the past 30 years or so, he's, uh, ha he has an extensive body of work, starting with collaborative performances with a group called Shrimps, uh, to his humorous photographs, sound installation, and um, often large kinetic sculptures. Um, Martin, I think, if I can speak for you, touches upon many different themes. Some of it deals with a lot of humor and its pathology, uh, interest in where failure can lead you, and of course, a general sense of bewilderment when you're looking at his objects. He has exhibited widely. Um, we were talking with the Whitney Biennial twice, the Kunsthalle in Bern, the, the Getty in California, Mocha Los Angeles, uh, the Pompidou in Paris, and so on. Uh, you can see his work locally as he's represented by Mitchell Edison Nash down in Chelsea. And he is the director of the graduate sculpture department at the Yale School of Art. So please help me welcome Mr. Martin Kirchhoff. Thank you um, for having me here. And I want to say also that uh, Andreas and I uh, met each other uh, many years ago in South Pasadena, California. Uh, where uh, he worked at a, one of the best video stores in Southern California called uh, Video Tech. And I didn't recognize him now. He's grown up to be such a beautiful man. <laughs> um, I would like to start by explaining this image a little bit. Uh, bounded by the Pacific and flanked by the north and south runways of the Los Angeles International Airport, I spent my formative teen years in a parcel of 250 homes cut off from other communities, known as the island. Living there was a wellspring in my aesthetic interest in machines, entropy, sound, and disillusion. When I was 10 years old, all of the homes were condemned by eminent domain for airport expansion. We were the next to the last family to move. So my SoCal, Kawabunga lifestyle of copper tone, jellyfish, sand, surf, fire pits, grunion runs, and pot was interspersed with noise from ground pounding earth movers, jet contrails, and destruction. Slowly over a period of five years, the houses were either bulldozed or put on wheels and rolled away, literally. It was, a, it was pathetic. Both my friends and their houses moved away. Near the end, at the age of 15, I was left alone to roam the streets on my Schwinn Stingray bicycle, pedaling past empty lots of crushed foundations and driveways that led into sand dunes. The houseless streets are still at the edge of the airport. Next time you leave, the Los, An you leave Los Angeles by plane, look down as you take off, and there you are. So uh, it really, truly was growing up in Southern California and this kind of place cut off in a certain way from friends that I think was this, this moment of that the embrace of solitude and, uh, and the idea of imagination. Uh, I'd like to ask you as a group, uh, by either, I can see your hands. So either a show of hands or a vocalization, we could do both, uh, what your interests are. Um, who of you are interested in moving image work? Uh, who of you are interested in sculpture? Oh, good. Who of you are interested in painting? I'm sorry, I don't have any to show. <laughs> I apologize. Um, uh, performance? Good. Okay, so we so we have a lot to talk about, and I'll I'll uh, try not to get too bogged down in too many details. But my uh, what I would consider my professional career began with performance and uh, with a group called Shrimps, and it was this the first uh, time that I was able to. Uh, feel I had I was doing something that was sort of greater than myself or outside of myself and kind of had a different kind of sense of agency. 
uh, working with a group of people was both uh, enlivening and also uh, uh, difficult. I don't know how many of you have collaborated with people. It's difficult, isn't it? Like that you have these moments where you are actually very close to somebody and feeling that you're like seeing the same thing, right, in, the, in your mind's eye. And then maybe the next day you, you've lost it because you're, you're both, you're, your ideas have gone in maybe different directions. And it takes a lot of goodwill and also a, a good deal of uh, giving up ego to, in order to, I think, do this in, in a way that doesn't leave people scarred. I think people can collaborate and hate each other afterwards, but I don't want that to be my, oper my mode of operation. So I worked with shrimps for, for a number of years and then decided I wanted to go back to grad school. So I graduated from UCLA in 84 and uh, worked with shrimps till 92, 93, when I went back to UCLA to go, to go to grad school. But performance sort of has never left what I do, uh, whether it is through the sculptures or photography. So I'll, I sort of broke this up into, I'm not gonna say by medium, but sort of by approach. Uh, uh, I used photography uh, in this way to started using it in this way with the idea of capturing a moment, a performative moment, a highlight of a performance, uh, as opposed to trying to capture something within time, but an action that, that was dramatic or the sort of point of drama or the point before drama was going to happen. So in this case, with, the, with falling photos, which I made three different sets of triptychs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, it was always caught in midair before the collision with the earth. And this was, uh, I felt it was about gravity, but also lost grace. And each of these, these are actually, they're super large. I mean, they're five feet wide and uh, to almost three feet tall and color printed in color. And, um, and each one, uh, each of these kind of actions that I've done are not uh, singular, like, okay, I'll just go out, do three photographs, and I have three works of art. As you see here, down this snowbank, uh, that, that it just sort of was like I went down the snowbank and down the snowbank and just kept r jumping and falling backwards. Uh, the next series is about falling, or tripping, I mean, and the idea being this, instead of about gravity and grace, but rather about embarrassment and shame. And the embarrassment and shame is a, that, that when, uh, I, I found this to be more apparent on the East Coast when, where you actually have ice on the ground. Southern California, you don't ever have ice on the ground. But here, if you slip and fall, there's a sense of, um, you, uh, at least for the people I've observed of myself, like, no, no, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm fine. Like, I'll just get up, you know, I'm fine. The idea being, I think it's sort of this last barrier between us and total loss of control within the world. We think, you know, the world has us going, but we think we have control of our bodies. So the idea of this fall, it becomes this, heightened sense of, I don't know, embarrassment, or I took it to maybe shame even. Uh, I started working with people and created tossing photos where I became kind of this agent, this, this uh, carnival ride in a way. And so these are from a series called Tossing a Friend Patty. This is Melinda number two, Ryan, Melinda number three, and uh, I, I try to incorporate, like the collaborations I did with Shrimps, I like to use friends within my work or people that uh, I trust and trust me. So the idea of going to ask someone 
who doesn't know me or hiring uh, an actor or someone to say, hey, I would like to toss you. Uh, like that there's sort of, there's a lot of sort of explaining to do and there's maybe contracts and there's a whole kind of arc of work. But when I go to Melinda or to Ryan, who I've known for many years and, and they know my work, I ask them and sort of it's like, sure, I'll do that. Like, let's do that. When do you want to do it? What time next should I come? So there's this kind of expediency in making work to rely on friends, as long as your friends aren't super flaky, right? Um, the, which is something that I think it, within, the, within the context of art school here, I know you guys aren't all in the same classes and you all work in different, you know, different ways, but the, the thing that I got out of s school was that the, the closeness of of working together and of that kind of coming together and keeping that those links forged after school because I think for me those are the people that I go to time and time again in order to help me. Uh, this is, I turned from tossing people to people smacking me, so friends, there's a, about seven different people for that. Um, Whirling, where I used, I, I had friends that I held by their ankles and whirled them while I was taking, while they were taking my portrait. So this idea that, that you know, kind of ref, about friendship, that we're in each other's kind of uh, orbit, right? So a slight blurring of the frame. Uh, these are just printed uh, for those who want, they're they're not digitally manipulated. They're shot on on uh, transparency film, and then printed as Ciba chrome. So with uh, maybe dodging and things like that, but no manipulation or filters used to smear them. This is all within the camera. Patty, whirling Patty. Portraits that I did for uh, these are. Portraits that I did for a, uh, that were in re relation to a performance called Orchestra for Idiots, where I made these sculptures that you can see here. This is what I called a drop box. And <clears throat> these are kind of adapted and created out of the idea from radio programs, right? This is going back pre digital pre, I don't know, I guess just pre-digital, the idea of trying to create sound effects to, to make a narrative larger. And the objects themselves, I think, have this very, very kind of strange, uh, uh, I thought, minimalist sensibility to them of kind of, you know, slightly Art Povera-like, slightly, you know, kind of reductive in their forms because their duty wasn't how, to how they looked, it was about how they sounded. And so the, 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 the tension between the how they looked and how they sounded what I, what, what was what I was interested in, this... Uh, this brutal, hard edge, clunky look, but the it, how the sounds could be evocative and kind of broadening this kind of sense of imagination. So in order to sort of work through that and to have people understand that within the show that these objects were actually kind of like instruments, I, I created portraits of people, of friends again, who uh, used, you were posing with their instruments as if they were part of an orchestra or something. Um, so this is with Le Leslie with uh, the door. As you see, as, an, uh, as it's that she's playing it almost like it's a harp, but as you see with the door, there's different kinds of locks and chains and everything because you don't know which sound you need, and it slams, 
And for the opening of the show, I wrote a score and conducted all the objects. Um, these are fat, icky photographs. I'll go through those. Um, I'd like to talk, go back again to the 90s, <clears throat> and these are uh, sculptures that be, were stand-ins for my own performance. So uh, performative objects, I don't know how, you know, I think many people describe them in different ways, but mostly they were mechanized, uh, but sometimes they also had sound elements. So in this case, this is, this whole structure is somewhat of a self-portrait. This is a little table with a motor attached to it with a flywheel. This is a Fender guitar amplifier. This is oh, these wooden balls that are basically to sort of represent myself as a landscape, uh, like the big stomach, legs, head. Sitting on top of the belly is a CD player, an amplifier. Do you guys know what a CD player is anymore? Does anyone use that? Uh, so CD player and playing on this are three different songs. And as the songs play, these balls droop down and then rise back up, kind of like one of those figures that you press and they flop, those rubber band little figures. So this idea of like coming down and, and kind of collapsing only like, but then coming back up and becoming tight. So I, I, chose three songs and then recorded them at a karaoke studio. Uh, and it's played in completion. The first one. Spring was, was never, never waiting, waiting for us, dear. dear. It led one step ahead as we fall into the dance. So this is MacArthur Park, the Donna Summer version. Um, MacArthur Park is melting in the dark. All that sweet green I see flowing down. Someone left the cake out in the rain. Oh, don't think that I could take it. Cause it took so long to make it And I'll never have that recipe again Oh no! So the cake is in the rain <laughs> The cake is in the rain and it melts and you can't get it back. And here's this sense of loss, the loss of the sweetness of life. Now, the second song within the, why does that keep going on? The second song within the cycle, which is my personal ring cycle, is uh, I Will Survive, which is about, you know, getting your shit together, coming back, kicking the bad boyfriend out, like changing the locks on the door and gaining your power back. So from loss to gain, right? From loss to gain. Then the, th but I didn't want it just to be kind of this, how should I say this sort of binary situation because I think we live in a more complicated world than that. And the third song is a, a Carpenter's song, if you've ever heard of Karen Carpenter. And this is on top of the world. And it's basically about kind of the, about love and how great love is and how great it makes you feel. And so it, it, it sort of is in this um, Prozac place. So there's like loss, there's gain, and Prozac. I see not a cloud in the sky and the sun in my eyes. And won't be as as if it's a dream. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> um, another kinetic or work that includes media is a piece called Loud House, uh, which um, 
this is a, about a 12 foot tall, 11, 12 foot wide and uh, 16 foot deep structure made of corrugated tin wood uh, with inside the walls of the inside sandwich inside our bottles, empty bottles. And on top of it is a uh, video of myself clog dancing, not in any kind of traditional sense of clog dancing, but in a my own kind of building storm of clog dance. Because the video the video was was routed to this monitor, but the sound was routed to this series of special coneless speakers within the walls that so when every step that I took with wood on wood would cause a boom, boom, boom on the walls. So that as I start, very softly, very sweetly, boom, 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 to building to this crescendo of boom, 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 boom. So, it uh, subtlety to complete overwhelm uh, the 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 piece builds to this intensity of that you can literally stand in the gallery and I did this and you could be yelling to someone standing next to you and you can't hear so I I basically turned the whole structure into a speaker. Uh, Attempt to raise the temperature of a container of water by yelling at it. Um, this is sort of part of a series of kind of uh, hair-brained experiments, hair-brained and half-assed experiments. In this case, with the idea that sound waves in water could vibrate the water the same way a microwave oven vibrates molecules, thereby the vibration uh, creating heat as things rub up against each other. <laughs> and that the temperature would rise. So the, this is a seven gallon glass jar, a underwater speaker, a recording thermometer, and uh, a, another thing called a cassette tape at that time, uh, uh, and as it plays, the sound is heard coming from the water. I am trying to raise the temperature of this water by yelling at it. I am trying to raise the temperature of this water by yelling at it. I am trying to raise the temperature of this water by yelling at it. I am trying to raise the temperature of this water by yelling at it. I am trying to raise the temperature of this water by yelling at it. I am trying to raise the temperature of this water by yelling at it. So as you see, 
the 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 video documentation just takes you into the the various parts of the piece and as it goes on uh the the tape repeats at it re repeats and and just i get i get more intense by yelling louder and if you see this thermometer As you see, the temperature is fluctuating. See here, this is the temperature, 81, 82. But it's, it, it's probably just really all bullshit. Um, <laughs> because probably it's just about the ambient temperature within the room. Uh, though I have speak, spoken to friends who actually are way smarter than I am. And they say the theory works, but that the system that I've created is has no sense of control or controllability. Um, um, I want to talk about a piece called Music Machine. Um, this is uh, a piece I did in Naples, Italy, where now this, there's an object, but I'm going to use it to perform with. So I was invited to work with this gallery and uh, and I went and thought the, the ubiquitousness within Naples, especially the old part of town of the Vespa. So I had a Vespa altered at an auto stereo shop to include, again, a CD player, uh, a subwoofer, some speakers in the shield and the grill, and then I would ride through the city, uh, playing my songs, bringing kind of, well, how should I say, my culture of America to the place of Italy, being a cap of, uh, 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 a dirty consumer capitalist into the old parts of the old world. Here I am in the Piazza Gesù Nuovo, the Plaza of the New Jesus. And one, one pill, pill makes, makes you larger, larger and one, one pill, pill makes you small. And, and the one that mother gives you don't do anything at all. Go ask Alice when she's ten feet tall. And if you go chasing rabbits and you know you're gonna fall, Tell him a hookah-smoking caterpillar has given you the call. A call, Alice, when she was just small. When men on the chessboard... So, so the song falls apart at that point. But the experience of driving through the city, right? And having this this sort of machine that is playing so sound at this very loud volume is is both this to some a pleasure but to some a, a, an assault. And and I didn't realize like how assaultive it would be even though I came from a culture of of uh, in Southern California, where ca where cars are sort of everything, right? And cars are uh, places where people eat and where people sleep and where people, uh, you know, do their do you know uh, faxing, believe it or not, or put on makeup or play music very loud. And so I was I was interested in that kind of situation of of going through these small streets and doing that. And uh, I was almost arrested, but, <laughs> and almost my, but not because of the sound, because Naples is a city that had almost no rules, except my Vespa was not licensed. And that was, 
it, it took a lot of people to talk them out of hauling it away. They have this flatbed truck with a crane on it, and it just takes Vespas away. It's just full of Vespas. <sighs> this is a piece called Tumble Room, and uh, this is at the Tangley Museum in Basel, Switzerland, in, uh, I think, 2011 or 12. Uh, and Tumble Room started as an idea of uh, to make a videotape uh, called Pink Constellation. And Pink Constellation was this, this, uh, was this, to create a room, a room that was a girl's room and a room of change. And that through this device, which is, this is it, and when we're shooting, turns so that everything, so that you can walk on the walls and the ceiling and everything stays in place. Uh, I wanted to uh, have this sort of comedic, but yet at the same time, uh, thoughtful space for this young girl. And in the video, the, the scenes with her are intercut with myself as this sort of, I would I like to call it a ghost who uh, is not so cute, not so introspective, and way, way, way more clumsy. And so the, the video is shown in one room, and then the sculpture, which is called Tumble Room, is shown in another. And the idea for Tumble Room is that it sort of is sort of the, the physicality of the creation of fantasy. And here, at the Tangley Museum, uh, I set the room, and then at some point we turn the room on, and it and it turns. And as you see, this is the moment when it turns because everything within the video is nailed down, or starched, or you know glued in some way. Here, it's all uh, becomes this kind of giant rock tumbler and starts to grind the things on. Uh, to a pulp and sort of becomes this uh, detritus machine. Um, for each for each time I show it, um, I create a whole new room, uh, usually from people's uh, extras, cast-offs of uh, clothing and or furniture. I make new collages. Uh, that uh, kind of mark the time. It's a it's sort of an interesting thing for for at this point I was fifty years old to be a fifty year old man trying to think of like a teenage girl. Uh, when I was first making it, I talked to a lot of teenage girls and went uh, to see their rooms and to see how they expressed themselves and. And the first thing that struck me is how messy they were. And uh, this, this girl's room is, less, is not so messy, but it becomes really messy. So, but each time I do the show, I make new collages. And so here are the ones from 2011, I guess. So uh, I, this is my hotel room where I was late in getting them, so I was making them every night while we were setting up the piece, because the piece takes a few days to set up. And so I was making them in the hotel room at night and then uh, setting them up. So here we have Miley, we have Justin, we have uh, Justin, the big Justin, little Justin. We have, we have Katie, we have Snoop down there, Eminem the cast of Glee, which was really po popular at the time. So these, these kind of, these, these uh, collages were sort of an indicator of, of time. Also like uh, this, this girl's room, she liked dogs. This is her chocolate lab, which are really stupid dogs. Uh, very lovely, but very stupid, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, to, in, does anyone have a chocolate lab? Do you love your chocolate lab? Is he stupid or she? Yeah, okay, so I'm not wrong. No, I'm not wrong. It, it's not like I'm really in that insulting. I'm just being observant. Yeah, but lovely at the same time, right? <laughs> um, 
I'm going to, I want to get to some other work. Um, this is, this is a piece called Dionysian Stage. Uh, again, to sort of talk about performance, the, you know, this sort of this, this sort of this, my, if I'm going to take a little stock here about how I'm sort of not struggling, but how I'm sort of using performance or trying to kind of either bring performance to objects, photograph performance, or or make objects perform for me, uh, that I started thinking about uh, using objects not as something to perform with, but to sort of perform on, right? Sculptures that have some sort of uh, 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 availability of to be big enough to actually be thought of as something to be in or on rather than to be used with or in conjunction, right? So that they became a space, not just a thing of performance, but they became a space of performance. And the first, maybe one of the first efforts, and it, I don't think I was really clear in my mind what I was doing at that time, but I was, this, this, uh, the show was at the, uh, it was a show at, at uh, uh, Pompidou called Dionysiac. And so uh, this sort of, uh, it, was, it was the curator's idea was to kind of accentuate Dionysian ideas of aesthetics as opposed to Apollonian, right? The, the Apollonian, the golden, the golden mean, uh, kind of order, uh, you know, kind of the working towards kind of symmetry. Uh, as opposed to the Dionysian, which is sort of a falling apart or which has kind of elements of ribaldry or kind of the, the kind of the underbelly of humanity in some ways. I mean, it, it, there's many ways to define it and many people uh, took it in very different directions. But I was interested in sort of the idea of the Dionysian as, this, as a way of, of, of uh, causing discomfort or, or tension. So to make a nest, right, this nest form, which is uh, nearly 14 feet, no, 12 feet tall at this point, over 14 feet wide, uh, made of mostly household objects, right? Or willow as this sort of, willow reeds as this sort of underlying base, but uh, furniture, chairs, uh, cradle, clock, clothing, uh, you know, just things from my life, things from people's or people I know also, just gathering objects and forming them into this sort of nest that, which I always sort of felt was this sort of symbol of home and safety, yet turning it into this sort of like whirlwind slash nightmare slash what kind of animal created this. So this is it, and it turned very slowly so that it, uh, it, it came around to you, so to speak, right? You didn't necessarily have to walk around it. So it was performing in this way of coming around to you. And this is at the Pompidou, which was, a, I think, the original show in a bad, like, you find as an artist, which is an interesting thing, you think, well, I'm an artist. I'm in control of everything. Like, I control how it's supposed to be displayed. I control the, I'm the rule maker. But you're not at always. You're not. You just, you have rules that occur in every building. You can't light big fires. You can't use spray paint. You can't do things like that, right? You, you can't maybe have a live bacteria, right, open to an air source. So there are already kind of these health and safety rules, but there are other things that a lot of times you know, the curatorial staff would like to, pl where they want to place the work as opposed to where you would like to place the work. And there's, so, the, so art in this kind of way is a negotiation uh, about the ideas with, that you have within the work versus sometimes that the ideas that maybe the administration, like in terms of safety, or the curator in terms of what they are trying to work through within their uh, show or their ideas and to come to some sort of agreement. But in this case, I couldn't overcome that they wanted to put this railing because they felt that people would be hurt if they stood next to this. In other places that I've shown it, we've shown it without the railing and no one 
has gotten hurt, though I have had my head hit my head on the birdcage, but I didn't get hurt any more than I am already. Um, so this, but it, it for me, it sort of lost some of the, it lost some of its power. And this is, I think, a really good lesson for the world outside. Like, you, you, you have to, you know, you have to be adaptable in some way, in a lot, in most cases. Uh, anyway, so these are just some of the things that now, which I think is really interesting because these were pulled out uh, at the Pompidou and just sort of photographed so we knew we had them. And by now, they're actually all packed in individual little foam containered boxes, like because it's made this transition from my work to belonging to somebody else. And it's not any longer just sort of this thing that's out in the world. It's, it, it's cited, right? It's cited with somebody. And therefore, there's, again, rules that come into place. They can't just throw this all in a box. So back to the stages. Um, this, is, this is a piece, Rickety, which was a couple of years later. And the idea with this was to create a sculpture that was a stage. So literally, it was going to be a stage that a choreographer uh, was going to create a performance or dance for. And this is at the Tang Museum in Saratoga Springs, New York, upstate, near past Albany. And, uh, and it was great to be able to bring a new work into the show that, into the context of the show. And so it was made mostly on site, which is something that I've done many times before. Uh, but that here is this work that I talked a lot about with the choreographer, the space that's 14 by 18 feet clear top, so to speak, and kind of at a four foot level. So the level of this red piece of banding is sort of at the eye, your eye level as you sit, so that you're sitting looking at these two spaces, these two worlds, the top which is clear and reaches out and the bottom, which you can access through, there's a hole here at this tree and a hole here. We just called them rabbit holes that you could, that the, the performance would take place up top and below. And it was, it was a, a very good dance, but I felt that the, that the piece still didn't function as a sculpture. It per, functioned as a stage, but not as a sculpture. So for the, uh, 2010 Whitney Biennial, I had the opportunity to um, create more, to create another performance space, but the curators and I had talked about that. And, uh, and I decided that instead of making kind of one singular space that I would actually make five spaces that each one was not exactly a whole performance space, it was, they weren't exactly always at the easiest maybe to, to work on. They were somewhat, they were all at the same height and they were all movable. So they could all be shifted to, in order to sort of have a performance and they all reflected something about that comes from performance. The sound, these are speakers, there's microphones, there's this weird little prop cabinet, there's an oratorial stand here and in, the show, there was a little record player that played the run-out groove of an album. Do you guys know what the run-out groove is? It, in an in a LP, it's where the record just goes around and it just goes So that there is always this presence of some sort of memory or place of performance. And so for that biennial, uh, I also organized uh, uh, seven or eight shows and that the Whitney also organized about five more shows of different kind of performances. There was an, uh, a, a kind of a performance lecture on uh, Lacan's mirror stage. Uh, there was a band, Japanther, played on it. There were the... Um, what is the, the, the Pizza Hut Taco Bell song, Das, das Racist? Do you guys know that? Do you know it? Do you know that song? Yes. 
Okay, let's, can we do it together? Let's do it. I'm at. Which one do we start with? I don't know. Which one do we start with? I'm at that Taco Bell. I'm at that Pizza Hut. I'm at the Taco Bell Pizza Hut. Or Pizza Hut. Right. So, so we can. So do it by yourself. I'm sorry. Okay. Can you can you stand up? Okay. Can you come to actually come down here and do it in the microphone so we can all hear it really clearly? What's, I'm sorry, what's your name? My name's Shannon. Shannon, thank you. Yeah, sure. So, okay. I'm at that Taco Bell, I'm at that Pizza Hut. I'm at that Taco Bell combination Pizza Hut. Yeah. I'm at that Taco Bell, I'm at that Pizza Hut. I'm at that Taco Bell combination Pizza Hut. Everybody! I'm at that Taco Bell, I'm at that Pizza Hut. I'm at that Taco Bell combination Pizza Hut. One more time. The Taco Bells. Come on, guys. Pizza Hut. I'm at that Taco Bell combination Pizza Hut. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, so there was so this the the sculptures the sculptures were not. They, the sculptors, I, I was trying to think of them instead of these, a way to ease a performance along, but rather that the performance was sort of a growth out of the sculptures, like a live growth out of these weird kind of, well, not weird, they're very party-like maybe, but uh, these oversized tables or tankish prop rooms or weird oratory stands, uh, in, you know, that, that, the, that the person or person, people on it became these kind of, you know, outgrowths of the work as opposed to them, it being just sort of as a way to frame the people. And to be honest, partly successful, partly, I think. Um, I, I will finish with... Uh, there's these sculptures. I, I went back to, you know, from I'm from Los Angeles and I moved here in 2012 to the East Coast. And here, here are, uh, I made, I was interested in kind of making sculptural forms and interested back in making things that were silent and, you know, kind of dealing with ideas of space and, you know, tension and materiality. This is like, uh, this is a chair that is kind of modified or, you know, with two chairs to become this kind of uh, scarecrow kind of stand that these are shirts that are, uh, there's about 60 shirts here that are just one over the other to kind of create this body form of, of cloth. Here is a, uh, a ball made up of every single page from this dictionary of the, uh, the I think it was called the Modern Dictionary of the English Language. So it's like all the paper shredded, kind of not quite, not masticated, but shredded and then put back into a ball, like sort of all of the English language into one kind of solid sphere that you almost gonna like spit or something like that. But again, I couldn't, like I didn't want to just leave it at that. So within this show, I also created a, created this uh, merch merchandise store, this like merch table. I was like, kind of interested about the experience of seeing something and then having the um, merch to sort of represent or hold upon the experience of a viewing. And so I enlisted two of recently graduated Cal Arts students to to you know, have this table of things that they were making, and I made some too, like that uh, uh, Tony made, uh, like uh, out of kind of little pieces of balsa, he made like a Duchamp uh, wine racks. Uh, so he made all these little Duchamp pieces. He made wooden iPhones, uh, drew portraits. Uh, they made magazines and collages. And so that they were there while the show would be running and sort of have this place of 
that was in between these spaces of these kind of of these sculptures uh, and uh, and be this place for merchandise. Uh, it 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 really was. I liked the idea, but it was very unsuccessful as a show. I think people couldn't quite make out what was going on and what was what was what was. They didn't make the jump that I wanted them to. Like in for the most part, and I will just end with. Uh, a more recent show just uh, this past year in Paris uh, where, uh, where there were several pieces, uh, new pieces and a, and a couple of older pieces, but within the center of the room, there was a wall that, and that wall um, slowly rotated. You know, so it rotated to kind of with this idea of of creating different shows, right? Because of the wall being this kind of barrier, but it also, but so that you could have these viewing experiences of, of three different pieces of work, but then at a moment you would maybe see two other different pieces of work. And there was also this sense of that you, uh, the, the viewer could not quite get uh, situated within the room because of the, the wall, not that it was threatening, because it was very light, wasn't, it moved very slowly, it was a very geriatric paced wall, but it, it wasn't, it didn't allow you to find the center, and so that you stayed always sort of on the periphery, like looking from the outside in, and it was, it was such a simple device, yet it worked so well to kind of create a very unique, viewing experience. Um, and I'll just close with, this is a, in Italy, uh, where the gallery I was showing these, Fat Iggy, which is sort of my take on Iggy Pop, um, he made these posters uh, that were like, uh, rock shows are advertised in Italy and just put them up in cafes or something. So I very much enjoyed coming across these at different cafes. So thank you very much. And if there are questions, I'd be glad to answer any and all. Yes. Um, I'm interested in, um, well, I'm interested in a lot of like peripherally or brushing against things like I have like science, like bootstrap science. Uh, you know, I, I have friends in many fields, in medicine, in physics, in mathematics, and I've collaborated actually with some uh, mathematicians and before on projects. So I like to read a wide range of things. Uh, so it, it comes from, the stimulus comes from the outside and just uh, trying to be open to the world, right? Trying to be open to information and sometimes a th something will will spark an interest, and then then that's the thread I pull on, right? That's the thread I pull on. And sometimes it comes to me accidentally, and sometimes like I seek it out. Like to, if doing sound pieces, I'm not say I know I'm nowhere near an you know a acoustician or something like that, but you know that I that I research more, like when I'm trying to do a piece. So it's but sometimes it just comes upon you. Well, I, I, I have to say that one of maybe the most profound live experiences I've had was this moment when I was uh, performing with this, I, was a, I wasn't hired, I was asked to be kind of the second banana for this person's performance piece and uh, this was years and years ago, and like there was this moment when I was doing this simple action, and I realized I I was ha I had this connection, like I felt like there was like a wire running between me and the audience, like it was it was like it it, it froze me for a moment because it felt so. Uh, un indefinable, undefinable, indefinable, indefinable. 
but at the same time so visceral and real. And it later on reflection, I was saying like, no wonder like some musicians like go to alcohol, Keith Richards hook, gets hooked on hair because there's no experience. I can't imagine like being in front of thousands of people and having a relationship with them, right? The power of that. So I appreciate the audience and I like to set up my shows many times as, uh, as to think about how the viewer walks into the room, what's their first experience, what's their last experience, how they, you know, how the work unfolds. And I'm not saying that's unusual, I think a lot of people do that, but I'm, I'm, I, try to be, I try to be a fan too when I'm setting up a show, right? I wanna be a fan and not just the artist enforcing something, but to actually think that, maybe I understand what the audience, you know, how the audience can experience this. So it is, there is that sort of like bringing certain things to the attention. <laughs> uh, it, I was wondering like how that was, it, well, it's moving through me off horribly. Like I, you know, like I have, I'm sort of finally back to sort of making work. It, it sort of took me away from work for almost a year and a half, like just making a piece here and there. Uh, but now that I'm, I'm uh, here, I think what has changed is uh, that I see more work than I did in Los Angeles. And I think that that has its own excitement like when you see something like the gober show or something like even if I'm not a fan like it's not at all the work i respond to but i feel like you go to see a gober show and then you go see uh uh i don't i don't i'm sorry I'm, my mind is blanking but you see another show and also you go what well, two hugely powerful shows and i think that's what's that do what that is doing to me is making me think of how can I be powerful too? How can I make powerful work, right? How can I join this conversation? Or can I join this conversation? I'm not saying I'm up to it, but it makes me want to try to be up to it because I think it's, it, the results can be so profound. Uh, but I don't want to also leave the the unexpected that I kind of, how I worked in Los Angeles. I don't want to leave that notion of like discovery and crazy wackiness. <laughs> Does that make sense? As much as it can make sense. Thank you for asking. Um, humor, humor is really interesting and complicated. And humor is a high wire act in front of a live audience uh, because humor is a violation. Humor is a violation to some sort of sensibility, some code of ethics or morality, or it is some sort of observation upon uh, failability. And how it stays to be humor as opposed to an insult, right? As opposed to being an insult or to cross into some other realm of hurt, of disbelief, of deep pain, is that it is benign. And this is what's called, and this is not my invention, this is called the benign violation theory of humor. Incongruity plays into it, but the idea of a benign violation, two things happening simultaneously. There is a violation, but it is benign. And through that combination that you're able, through the benign comes from being either psychologically distant or uh, not part of your moral or ethical code, and therefore that you can see that or feel that it's a violation, but yet not actually be affected by it, by that violation. And so I see humor as a very uh, subversive, potentially subversive act or a subversive vehicle. 
And I like to use humor as a way to attract or to invite people in order to maybe consider some maybe deeper or potentially darker things. Not always, and it doesn't always work. And uh, just like not all people can tell jokes, right? Sometimes not all pieces of work can carry all those, can carry it being humorous and deep at the same time, but that's what I try to do. Well, thanks. Thanks, guys. Much appreciated. <laughs>